You're listening to the Bloomberg Sound On Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 1 Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts. Haley Lines here joining the conversation with Wendy Benjaminson. Wendy, I know you've covered a lot of ground already, but we really need to dig into the legal troubles of the former president because this obviously isn't something going away. I now, on my computer every day, in addition to my newswire and my email, things I always keep track of, also have True Social up. Well, that's to a good idea. Former President Trump's page. For example, six hours ago, he just posts in all caps, election interference. And of course, that's likely a reference to the multiple indictments <laughs> that this former said, president had. Interference? Yes. <laughs> okay. All caps, though. All caps. Uh, and of course, we've had to pay a lot of attention to this, not just as he has been repeatedly indicted, but also as we get questions around when we're actually going to see him go to trial. Absolutely. And the trial calendar is just insane when you overlay it over the primary calendar. Yeah. There will be the Iowa caucuses in January. In February, you will have New Hampshire um, and South Carolina, really critical states, South Carolina in particular this year because of the presence of its Senator Tim Scott and its former governor, Nikki Haley. Mm -hmm. And then you have Nevada. And then Fonnie Willis think she's going to trial with this massive RICO case, which I'm really eager to hear what Dave Ehrenberg has to say about this, in March. I mean, forget the politics for a moment. It'll be interesting to hear how he's going to do this. And then Alvin Bragg gets his bite at the, mm -hmm. at the Big Apple, so to speak, um, on March 25th. And then um, in May, May classified his documents. classified documents trial is well, supposed and, to start. And not to mention... The Department of Justice in the Washington case, here where we are, requested January 2nd. Right, which is, you know, also really interesting to see. And also in civil cases, Trump is yes. really good at delay tactics. It may not work as well in criminal court, mm. but he is he has faced 3,500 lawsuits as a businessman. Wow. And in almost every one, delay has been his, his best friend. OK, so we'll see if it works in the criminal cases. You mentioned him, Wendy, so let's get to him now. Dave Ehrenberg, state attorney for Palm Beach County, is joining us. Dave, great to get your perspective on this. Let's first just begin with that proposed start date in Georgia of March 4th, 2024. Do you think that is a realistic timeline for this trial in what, as Wendy rightly points out, is a very wide-ranging case with lots of defendants? And by that, I mean 19. I think Wendy is right because Fonnie <laughs> always Willis, a good way to start. Dave. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she charged 41 counts, uh, 98 pages of uh, 161 overt acts of the alleged conspiracy. I mean, she even cited conduct in states that are not her own. I, I was in awe of this indictment. It was a tour de force. Uh, <laughs> but because of that, I don't think this is going before the 2024 election. I think Fonnie Willis's best chance is to get a bunch of the 19 defendants to flip, to cut a deal, and then to have just a couple of these defendants left to try before the election. But even then, RICO is still such a complex charge that I don't see how this is going to get done, especially competing against all the other cases over Donald Trump's head. So I think the good news for people who want accountability is that she is the first prosecutor to try to hold accountable all the leaders of the attempted coup. But the downside is that I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Well, let's go to that timeline then. If it happens after the 2024 election, and let's just say for a moment that Donald Trump wins. He is the president-elect. By January 20th, 2025, he would be president of the United States again. I thought sitting presidents can't be involved can't be defendants in a criminal case so how would that even work We're one of the of great well one of the great things about our job as state attorneys or district attorneys is that the u.s attorney general is not our boss the president mm -hmm. is not our boss we don't have to subscribe to the department of justice guidelines which say that you cannot indict a sitting president so she can indict him and she can try to put him on trial i suspect the courts would step in and say that as long as he's president, you can't put him on trial and you're going to have to wait till after he leaves office. Now, if that's the case, and this is uncharted territory here, we've never had this before, mm -hmm. but if that's the case, 
uh, I think that uh, the the state cases in Georgia and New York uh, will be more powerful than the federal cases because Donald Trump will certainly try to pardon himself out of the federal cases. If the trials have not happened yet, he'll order his Department of Justice to drop those cases against them. But he cannot order the DOJ to drop a state case and he right. cannot pardon himself out of state cases. So it's great to be a state prosecutor. Well, there's also the question of whether or not he ever becomes president again. He still is a former president that we're talking about here who has been charged with crimes that, if found guilty, could mean prison time in Georgia specifically as he's charged with violating the RICO Act, that has a mandatory minimum sentence of five years. And it becomes a question as to whether or not we're actually going to see a former U.S. president be sent to prison. I asked this of Nick Ackerman, a former Watergate prosecutor on Balance of Power earlier this week. This is what he told me. The RICO count itself carries with it 20 years. Do I think he's going to get 20 years? No. Um, But he could definitely get some time. Um, Under that RICO statute, if he's convicted, um, there's a minimum of at least a five year sentence. Now, that doesn't mean five years in prison. It could be five years, three years right. probation, two years in prison. But yes, I think if he is found guilty, this is an extremely serious indictment. The allegations are serious. Uh, and if he's convicted, he's going to do time. So, Dave, as a prosecutor, would you push to send a former president to prison or would you be worried about the broader signal that would send? Well, no one is above the law, and so I would push to treat him like others in the same situation. One thing that Trump has going for him is that he has no prior convictions, although that could change by the time this trial comes hmm. about. Fair. I do agree with Nick Ackerman. Yeah, I do agree with Nick Ackerman that although Fonnie Willis at her press conference said there's a five-year mandatory minimum prison sentence, the way I read the statute is that it does not require a judge to order prison time. He can give or she could give probation, a fine, a combination of prison and a fine. So uh, we'll see. But I do think that if he's found guilty of these serious charges, that it is likely he will get some sort of of incarceration. It could just be house arrest, and that would be the lightest form. But he could be sentenced to a uh, prison stay. I know it's hard to believe and imagine that would happen. But look, who could ever imagine that a former president would be indicted four times already. We've never been down this road before. Well, and Dave, that leads to sort of the question of the the bigger picture that even state prosecutors would have to consider in this case is what happens to the country at that point. And as if you recall your you know, history, I guess it is now, Gerald Ford, you know, really wrestled with whether to pardon Nixon for you know, any possible crimes he might have committed because he was he thought the country had been rending itself apart over Vietnam and civil rights and other things. And it was just too much for the country. So he pardoned him. Um, Would prosecutors or judges take that sort of idea into account because we're not at 60s level yet, but we're pretty close. It's possible. But remember, back in the day when uh, Gerald Ford pardoned Richard Nixon, we were a different country. We were a country that watched Walter Cronkite all at the same time. We weren't as divided into our tribes now. It's shirts versus skins these days. And there is <laughs> nothing that a president, Biden, or any other future president can do when it comes to pardoning Donald Trump that would ever ingratiate themselves into the MAGA base. There's nothing that could convince Donald Trump's core supporters that Donald Trump is guilty or that Biden or anyone else is less than evil. I mean, these people, a lot of them think that Democrats drink the blood of babies. So I I just, I know I'm being a little uh, over the top here, but my point is that we're in a different society now. If you continue to try to appease the most radical elements in Trump's base, uh, it's gonna blow up in your face. And I just think you have to treat Trump like you would treat anyone else in the same situation, because that's the only way to show that no one is above the law and that, that we're not gonna be intimidated by threats of violence or rhetoric coming from the other side. Yeah, it's it's a very good point. And I think that is the violence and, and questions around the security of the jury, for example, have have arisen in we- recent weeks as a result of this indictment. You know, Wendy, you and I were discussing earlier that a number of members of the grand jury in Georgia were doxxed 
addresses posted online. So that's definitely uh, something we're going to have to continue to talk about. But Dave, just to go back to the kind of timeline question, Wendy was was talking about how in civil cases, uh, former President Trump has been very successful at delay, delay, delay. In these criminal cases, not just in Georgia, but also the one down uh, in your state of Florida, uh, the others, how many levers realistically are there for him and his defense team to pull do you think we could see any of these cases realistically fully wrapped up in a bow before the 2024 election? I think the two cases most likely to be tried before the election would be Jack Smith's case on the uh, election shenanigans in Washington, D.C., because you have Judge Chutkin who wants that case to move and Jack Smith limited his indictment to what he thought he could prove and uh, without dealing with complex First Amendment issues over uh, charging seditious conspiracy or insurrection. So I think that case is going to go. I think the New York case, which is the weakest of the four cases about the hush money payments, Mm -hmm. I think since that was first, that could go too. And so those are the two. The other two, I think, will happen after the election. I think the strongest case is the documents matter. But I think that case involves some some complex uh, issues over classified documents and a federal law called SEPA and the need to get clearances. So I think that's going to be delayed. Plus, you have a judge and Judge Eileen Cannon who has seemed to make rulings that have benefited the former president. So I think he'll have two cases that will be tried. But here's the thing. He may be found guilty, but then I think he'll stay out of jail pending appeal. Mm. And so I don't think you'll see full justice until after the election. Well, and I wanted to ask you about the judge and the trial prosecutor in Fulton County. Um, Apparently, the judge is fairly new to the bench, and the uh, prosecutor comes up from sort of small crimes division of the district attorney's office. And now these two are faced with a case involving the former president of the United States in a case that really, if without putting too fine a point on it, is about whether U.S. democracy still works. If you were them, would you be retching in a wastebasket as I would be having give, been given this assignment? <laughs> uh, uh, I would relish it. I mean, this is a a moment of a lifetime, a generation. You know, you, you don't get situations like this uh, in American history. And if now if you're the judge who was just recently appointed in Georgia, I mean, and this is thrust in your lap. I mean, this is why you want to become a judge is to to deal with a case like this that is about preserving American democracy. And so I think that's okay. But as far as their lack of experience, Judge Cannon is inexperienced and the judge in the Atlanta case is inexperienced. Doesn't mean by that nature that they're bad judges. That's our system. We have a system where, yeah, but we have a system where judges are assigned randomly to these cases. And sometimes you're going to get inexperienced judges and that's what appellate courts are for uh, to overrule their bad decisions. But um, I'm not as worried about that as I am the uh, the fact that there are going to be so many delays and there are not going to be cameras in the courtroom, except maybe in Atlanta, if that stays in state court, that there's just a lack of transparency. And you're going to have a whole segment of the population who will believe what they're told and won't be able to see it with their own eyes. All right, Dave Ehrenberg, it's really great, as always to get your perspective. I'm sure we're going to be talking to you a lot in the coming months. The state attorney for Palm Beach County, we appreciate the time. You're listening to the Bloomberg Sound On Podcast. Catch the program live weekdays at 1 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Middle of August, Wendy. Supposed to be a quiet month here in Washington. It has been anything but, arguably. It's a myth. The quiet (laughs) August is a myth, hasn't it? We haven't had one for years. Yeah, I think I'm I think I'm learning this. The thing is, as insane as August has been, I bet come September things are gonna be a whole lot crazier. Really just throughout the fall, because when we come back, when Congress comes back post Labor Day into session, it's going to be all about avoiding a government shutdown, which theoretically could happen after September 30th. And then one day later, when October starts, people are going to have to start paying their student loan debt again, something they haven't done for years. But that pandemic policy is coming to an end. It is. And right at the time that 
President Joe Biden is trying to sell his Bidenomics program and say that everything's great. Everybody will have a nice chunk of their paychecks uh, dedicated to paying off their student loans again. And it's just, you know, uh, bad luck. If, if Sometimes I think if Biden didn't have bad luck, he'd have no luck at all on, on selling <laughs> the economy sometimes. Well, this is something that not only you and I are paying attention to as journalists, but companies are paying attention to as well, because theoretically, this is going to change people's budgets. If they have to start repaying their loans, a couple hundred dollars a month, say, probably means they're going to spend less on other things. And this is something that came up on the call for Walmart. Of course, the huge retailer reported earnings today. And actually on the conference call, the company's CEO, Doug McMillan, said he sees a headwind coming from U.S. student loan repayments. We want to get more on the Walmart story and Target as well, which reported yesterday. Brendan Case is joining us. He is a U.S. retail reporter for us here at Bloomberg. So, Brendan, overall... What picture of the consumer is is both Walmart and Target painting here? They're both painting a picture of a consumer that is still spending, but is facing additional strains. Uh, And so, as you said, for Walmart, they're worried about the student loan repayments. That's actually the first time I've heard them talk about that. It's something that Target's been talking about for for a long time. Walmart also flagged uh, rising borrowing costs in general uh, and and, 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 and and just sort of the weakness of, of having uh, that part of your household budget under pressure. It's not at all a totally gloomy picture. Uh, the company's say that the strong jobs market is still helping their customers. And so, you know, they've still got uh, they've still got a fair amount of 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 demand. Uh, But, you know, there are some some cracks in the armor. The other big thing, of course, is just the continuation of the split between essentials and discretionary goods. So if you think about Mm -hmm. buying food versus buying, you know, electronics or home goods, um, you know, a lot of a lot of people are having to spend more on food after the inflation we've had the last couple of years and less on discretionary. That's why you're seeing Walmart turn in pretty strong sales gains while target sales are falling. Well, Brendan, uh, you know, the president is campaigning on the idea that the Inflation Reduction Act did what its name suggested it is supposed to do. And we do know here at Bloomberg that inflation is down. But are consumers and re- are consumers feeling it or do they just feel less rise in prices? Based on what Walmart and Target said it's much more towards the latter. And one thing that Walmart was at pains to point out is that, yes, inflation is, is, is coming down. Uh, yes, it's much less of an issue in a lot of the, the basic categories that they're, that they're selling in uh, than it was, you know, six or 12 months ago. Uh, however, it's not as if prices are going back to where they were before all of this happened. And mm-hmm. Walmart was at pains to say, you know, sure, inflation is down uh, in terms of the, the, the monthly inflation rate. But if you look at the food that we're selling, you know, and you look at those underlying food costs from suppliers, they're still up 20 percent over the last two years. Wow. Uh, and that's not going to go away anytime soon. And in fact, it's probably never going away. <laughs> well, Brendan, this, of course, being Bloomberg, we do care very much about the fundamentals and the pricing power that companies have. But this is also Bloomberg's politics show, the fastest show in politics <laughs> is what we like to call it. So there are political angles here as well, not just on the inflation story and President Biden that Wendy was talking about, but specifically this pushback we are seeing around the idea of woke. However you want to define it, it is a thing that is talked about frequently. And we saw just two months ago, back in June, Target specifically had a big issue with its pride displays in its stores. This is something that Brian Cornell, the CEO, spoke about on the earnings call yesterday. We have featured a Pride assortment for more than a decade. However, after the launch of the assortment this year, members of our team began experiencing threats and aggressive actions that affected their sense of safety and well-being while at work. I want to make it clear, we denounce violence and hate of all kinds, and the safety of our team and our guests is our top priority. So, to protect the team in the face of these threatening circumstances, we quickly made changes including removal of items that are the center of the most significant confrontational behavior. So, Brendan, is this just a convenient excuse for Target 
as it relates to some of what the company was actually seeing in terms of sales? Or is this an issue that's going to be ongoing for them? It's definitely an issue for them, and it's going to come up next year. It'll be interesting to see uh, how they handle it in 2024. But if we just look back at at what happened in June, they provided some interesting numbers uh, just kind of on a bottom line basis. Uh, mm-hmm. What they said is that their comparable sales, uh, you know, to simplify, you're talking about sales at, at stores that have been, that have been open uh, about 13 months and how that, that compares year to year. Uh, you know, they said that that metric fell 3% in May, 7% in June, which was after the controversy first erupted at the end of May, and only 5% in July. So in other words, there was a bit of a recovery in, in, in July. They resolutely refused to quantify the effect of the controversy over their pride collection. But those numbers give you a hint that there was a real impact in terms of of their sales. And what you heard uh, Cornell and the other executives trying to do is to sort of thread the needle. Uh, You know, what, what they know is that their customer base is something like a very broad swath of the American population. A lot of different opinions baked in there, a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different... Uh, consumer preferences. Um, they said that they don't want to get too far away from what their customers want. And you could read that however you want. I mean, that's a pretty ambiguous statement, but I think it'll be yeah. interesting to see what they do next year. And especially, I think the, the, the item I would watch is just how prominent those displays are. Mm. And you know, I think what you'll also see is that you'll see T-shirts and mugs and 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 things like that. That one of the items that um, was at the center of the controversy this year was a a, a bathing suit design, and I'll bet you that you're not going to see a, you know a, a lot more things like that. Well, we have just a minute left here, uh, Brendan. But what about the issue of rising thefts in these stores and shoplifting? What what did they say about that, and what would they like to see happen? So this is clearly a problem for them. They have different communication strategies about it. Um, hard to know exactly what the numbers are since they don't provide enormous amounts of detail. But Target said that it continues to be a very big problem. This is a company that said that uh, shrink, which is the sort of the retail jargon for a number of costs that include theft, um, is going to hit profits this year to the tune of half a billion dollars beyond what it did last year. And they said that that, that expectation still remains pretty much intact. Um, what they did say is that it's become more predictable and that, that that, sh- that shrink at least was in line with their expectations the most recent quarter, as opposed to being much worse. Hmm. Walmart spoke even less about it, but the one message that its CEO, Doug McMillan, did send is that it, he thinks that some U.S. jurisdictions need to do more to combat hmm. this type of crime. Well, and it's not just retail executives who have a message on crime. We're seeing it a lot in politics here in Washington as well. Brendan Case, Bloomberg U.S. retail reporter. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Sound On Podcast. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already at Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. And you can find us live every weekday from Washington, D.C. at 1 p.m. Eastern Time at Bloomberg.com.